These are my favorites. My grandfather and my mother. Isolated by the La Salle Causeway and the Rideau River. And it was like a world apart. Kingston was a world away. You would thought we were 50 miles from Kingston, but we really were right across the river. Fairfield always seemed to do really well in sports. We won at hockey, we won at baseball. We, like we, uh, I think my dad used to say that we were too miserable to lose or something like that. We're standing here about the center of Richard Cartwright's town site that he devised for the property he owned immediately north of the military reserve and very close to the, the activity that was going on on Point Frederick with its massive shipbuilding program. The plan was devised on a system of three streets running north and south, three streets running east and west. The one thing that Cartwright didn't do was to name the town site. That didn't happen until 1820, when the town site was named after Robert Barry, who had newly come the previous year to look after the dockyard. Our great-great-great-grandfather was the, later the Honorable. It was Richard Cartwright. He came to the Kingston area in about 1784, and at that time, because he was a loyalist, he was given about 3,000 acres, most of which was on the east side of the Cataraqui River. And one of those farm lots, he subsequently subdivided to become low-cost housing for the workers at the Navy dockyard, which was where RMC is now. He, um, he made a lot of money in his, trans, his business of transshipping goods from the Great Lakes, from, uh, from Lake Ontario, down to Montreal and beyond. Now he was, um, uh, he, uh, the, boat, the stuff was carried by small boats, bateaux, uh, down uh, down the, the rapids of the St. Lawrence, and I, I am told that there was a bit of a problem with the shipments of goods upstream, because besides the manufactured goods, these included whiskey and brandy, and we were told that the uh, some of the bateau people were quite uh, entrepreneurial and drilled little holes in the whiskey casks and drained some of the whiskey out and filled the casks refilled the casks with water. Now, Whiskey Island, which is, you know, is just downstream from Barryfield, got its name apparently because it was a key, shall we say, offloading point. These are individual glass negatives. Now, a lot of the, a lot of the ones that were in here, my grandfather was great at taking individual pictures of relatives especially his daughter, my mother, which is, there are multiple pictures of, these are the smaller ones. These are the larger ones. That's the commons below the village where that great big balloon is. That was all commons, it was all field, it was all pasture. I remember having the cows here on the commons. Well, everybody did, people in Kingston, I think, and up behind the village too, there was horses all over the place. Cows. Everybody had a cow. Jack Anderson had a cow in the village. Now that is one of the most vivid memories of my childhood. And I can remember these gypsies. And there might be two or three caravans at a time. And they were there in the spring and the fall. And I can still see them dancing, the men and the women, or girl, the young girls and boys, in their colorful costumes. And, and people would throw money at them afterwards. 
album both. They were they were fascinating. This was all commons. This was all open. This was BBB. We won't go there. Tell me about that. <laughs> oh, all the kids would remember that at my age. The, when the Army constructed the base, there were a lot of uh, construction and excavating they'd done, and there was one particularly huge pool. Basically, what I think it was stagnant water, but we all would go over there and go skinny dipping, hence the name BBB. <laughs> Until one day, the bus was driving by, and we decided to moon the bus, which we did. And then the next thing, the police showed up. And the police came up. Well, we saw the police, and we all started running, except one guy, Peter Warmington. The cops said, get over here. <laughs> and over goes Peter. And we're watching from, from the bushes. He's over there coming like this, talking to the cops. Peter was, uh, he was the sane one, the, the sober one of the group, and he went over and gave his name. I don't know whether he turned us all in or not, I don't remember. The cop was laughing so hard he couldn't even talk to him, I don't think. It was funny, little bare butts. I think we were probably 12 years old, just little young kids, oh God. I re oh, I just, I remember that. That was, that's something like out of an old movie or something. You know? <laughs> and BBB stands for? Bearball Beach. <laughs> you can, it was only boys. What do you got there? Now, there's some of the kids that I went to school with right there. That's Kenny Keese. That's me there in the background. I don't know if I got their names on or not. I can read them off. Okay, well, that's Kenny. I think, I don't know whether that was his first job. He come there as principal. There's Bob Ogilvy sent front and center. Yep, yep. I had a tough time, perhaps, though. There's young Gretel Gray right there, and Barbara Hess right beside her, and Bob Oakley. Get a few of them. There's Mary Cadu right there in the back. There's Wally Suds right there. That's another one. As soon as I saw him. Hmm. This road you see here was on the military property, and uh, we show that. This was military land. They had these uh, markers, uh, surveyor's markers, stone markers with the letter MR on them. And I uh, assume uh, that the MR stood for military reserve. Well, Berryfield had been um, a useful large area for the militia to come and spend uh, its two weeks of summer exercises that each man was expected to do. And of course, being close to the Royal Military College, uh, they had a number of uh, military personnel here and in the city, uh, which was the headquarters of the 3rd Military Division. And as the time went through the First World War, so Barryfield Camp uh, became more and more important. And by 1916, there were in the summer about 10,000 men under canvas training um, in this area. Well, we're looking. is looking down from one of the windows in our house over the commons. Those are military practicing. Kingston in the background. And this was called the bay. At the bottom of the hill, there's a roadway goes in there to the lake. Mm -hmm. okay. yep. That goes into Green Bay. Yeah, yep. and uh, these these would have been the places that we lived in. I'm not sure when we when we moved out, we were the last ones to go. Well, when I wasn't, they had to kick us out. <laughs> we were the only people left down there. There's a wife and me and late sixties, the kids. Maybe, or maybe late sixties or early seventies. They were all on a hundred year lease. All those properties down there, and then when the lease come due, the the government just bulldozed everything. Just bulldozed all everything. those houses. Yeah. Uh, the whole bay is of the village is gone. There was a a lot of people that lived down below the hill there and all those houses have been taken out. It was bought over by the army base. A lot of those houses have been removed. Uh, the houses that were down there were pretty much taken down and, and new ones put up. A lot of new uh, construction. 
So it's, it's changed a great deal. When my wife and I and child, children moved here in 1978, uh, there were still uh, boathouses like this one on the waterfront, but they stretched north along, along the river. And uh, that, uh, that's because Berry Field was a, a place where there was a lot of maritime activity. And the river, of course, was very, very busy. You had uh, small steamships going up to Ottawa via the Rideau Canal. Uh, there were uh, rafts, this is much earlier than 1978, we're now back uh, at the end of the 19th century. There were um, timber rafts coming down streams, some of that timber and logs uh, provided uh, the material needed for uh, the shingle mill that was located at the, at the end there, at Green Bay Point. So sailing vessels, uh, small yachts, uh, steamships, uh, boat houses, boat builders, uh, two taverns up in the main street. Uh, this was just a very, very active place. Lots going on in Berryfield. So two years after this house was built in 1818, uh, it, was, it was turned into a hotel. It was called the Richmond Hotel. It was the first hotel in Berryfield. And um, the reason they had uh, a number of hotels actually in Berryfield was that travelers coming from the east, from Ottawa, Montreal, who arriving later at night would have stayed the night on this side of the river before taking a boat across the next morning. And so they, they had an advantage that they could provide accommodation on this side of the river for travelers and tradesmen going into Kingston. And this would have been um, back in 1820 before the Penny Bridge was built, so you'd have had to be ferried across. Uh, to get across the Kanarakui River, originally there was a number of ferries. The road transportation, however, required uh, going up Montreal Street or Montreal Road as it was called at the time because that was the connection that led to a road network that went all the way to Montreal crossing at Kingston Mills. As the dockyard and the military establishment at, uh, on Point Henry at Fort Henry uh, developed and as Berryfield developed it became increasingly important to improve the transportation across the Cataraqui River. There was a series of proposals in the, in the 1820s to construct a bridge, culminating ultimately in a bridge that was constructed here and opened in 1829. It was known colloquially as the Penny Bridge because it cost a penny for a pedestrian to cross the bridge. Uh, St. Mark's Church was uh, founded in 1843 uh, by a group of uh, local uh, inhabitants, some from Barrowfield, some from the local uh, area. Uh, the reason for them founding a church was uh, the only Anglican church available to them at the time was St. George's in Kingston because they had been attending a, uh, a naval chapel down at what is now the Royal Military College, but it was closed. And so they had to go all the way to St. George's when met crossing the bridge, which was a toll bridge. They had to pay to go to church. So it seemed like there was enough people over here probably to found the church and avoid the travel. So they met in um, a tavern, as a matter of fact, in Barrafield, and, uh, and formed a group and a building committee. And quite remarkably, within uh, a little over a year, uh, they raised the money, built this church, and opened it in July of 1844, which is kind of interesting because it's exactly 30 years after the founding of uh, Barrafield itself. On the rise of ground behind me, right behind St. Mark's Church, is the location where the British planned to build Redoubt No. 2, uh, one of a series of redoubts that the British conceived uh, in 1829 to defend Kingston from a potential American attack. After the War of 1812, they saw that the fortifications that were built during that war were very ad hoc and not comprehensive enough to defend the city from uh, attack from all sides. So the plan that was evolved through the 18 teens into the 20s, finalized in 1829, conceived that to have these six redoubts and several towers. On the east side of Kingston, over here in, in Barryfield and on Point Henry, and on the west side of the town, west of where the, the settlement was, uh, three redoubts over there, three redoubts here, and the towers as well. Uh, during the War of 1812, which uh, ran from June 1812 up to uh, Christmas Eve 1814, the Royal Navy activity here was really quite phenomenal. There was 
by the end of the war, literally thousands of people would have been associated with this dockyard. They were building larger and larger warships here in uh, what was originally Haldeman Cove and then became known as Navy Bay. Uh, frigates, uh, four, 50, 40 gun frigates, and then eventually the um, first great ship of the line, the St. Lawrence with 102 guns, just an enormous ship. This is a uh, picture of James Knapp and Sons. Uh, we're on the very site where this, this boat, boathouse existed. And you know, the, the image itself is just um, full of activity, even though the, guy, the boss is here, he's just standing around keeping an eye on things. In the background is a beautifully crafted yacht, well varnished. Uh, it's got uh, brass portholes, scuttles. And in the foreground, you've got two fellows here who are building a mast. Uh, and that's quite a skilled piece of work. So the village uh, established a reputation for boat building, and you might wonder, how did that start? Well, it started in the early part of the 19th century when um, close to, the, close to uh, Kingston Harbour, behind us uh, a little bit, half a mile or so, the British uh, Navy Board established a naval base there, a, a Royal Navy dockyard. And the Royal Navy dockyard employed a lot of shipwrights, men who had a talent for building not only small craft, but also for building uh, big ships like the, like the St. Lawrence, for example, the 112-gun man of war. Well, they had to have a place to live, and many of them lived over close to the Royal Navy dockyard. But quite a few uh, started establishing themselves in, in, in Berryfield. And by the 1830s, there were stone houses, they're still around, that were built in the 1830s. And the people who lived in these houses were often uh, formally employed by the British Navy Board to build ships for the Royal Navy. So that's a tradition that goes way, way back. We're standing here on the edge of Green Bay, which in many ways was the heart of Barryfield. There are many things went on here. It's along the shore here, that the, many of the boat building establishments were located. As well, during the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, the Barryfield Regatta was held here with their rowing competitions, which the boat builders were quite interested in, of course. And then in 1843, uh, a chap by the name of William Hunt, with his partners, built a sawmill out on the point, on Green Point, and for a number of years operated that sawmill. His mill uh, operated for uh, uh, three years until 1845 when it burned. It opened again in 1846, so probably wasn't damaged too much, but Hunt gave up the lease to Martin Strawn in 1847. But uh, Martin Strawn was uh, uh, a bit more uh, business proficient and uh, operated that mill until uh, his death almost in 1900. After the uh, uh, mill operation and the mill was torn down, it wasn't the end of that particular site because uh, the Curtis Reed Aircraft Company, which was established in 1928, uh, leased the property the mill had been on and over the foundation built a seaplane port to uh, operate a, a seaplane training school. And in the uh, corrugated uh, steel building that they erected, uh, they had a Curtis Robin and on floats that they operated here and trained pilots. It was a short-lived operation because uh, it had to close up shop for lack of business in 1931. But again, not the end of the story on that particular site on the point uh, of Green Bay. Because uh, after the building was vacated by Curtis Reed, Dollar Bill moved in. And from there, he operated his entertainment business uh, and kept his stock and trade hidden neatly under the water. Of course, everybody knows him as the bootlegger of Barryfield. Why I remembered it so vividly is that the store door had a big cast iron opener. And one foolish day in the middle of winter, I stuck my tongue to it. 
<laughs> and it was a while coming off. And I might have even left some skin there, I'm not sure. But I remember that. That was Norris's store. That was Father's room on this end. And we the never boys used were in that the back room. and B was at the I back. I can remember when the phone went in. Yeah. The only phone in the village. Yeah. But there, that's Masuda, Masuda ice cream. Where is it? I think that's it right there, but I'm not sure. One of them on the side. It was on the side of the house. Masuda ice cream. So we were pretty mischievous in the village at times. Mm -hmm. I know on Halloweens we used to, or not even Halloweens, just bored. We'd go to the store and the Lehman's owned the store at that time. We'd say, can you phone the police and tell them where there's a lot of noise over here, a bunch of kids? So just so they'd come over and chase us through the village. <laughs> they couldn't catch us, but they used to just, it was, it was, that was, that was our fun. That's, I always found something to do we got bored, so. Bob drove one, Russ drove one, I think Bill used to drive the other one, the other brother that died, Bill. How many went? There was nine teams, men, and five women's teams there at one time. Not in the village. Yes. Yes, there was. The whole village went. Everybody went to these ball you games. You always went to ball games. I don't know what we did when we got there, but I do remember the truck and the ride, trying not to fall. Because <laughs> the roads, you know what the roads were like back then. There was no... Paid roads. And it, it's, it's funny when you get the old Berryfield sort of thing because I was taking my kids around on, uh, on Halloween. I, I took my little guy around. And as we got to Pete's, I said, yeah. I, I said to him, I said, when you go to the door, I said, ask him for a beer. Just as a joke sort of thing. Because he's only 10. Well, he walks to the door and the first thing, Pete opens the door and he says, want a beer? <laughs> and it's just like an old Berryfield thing. And... Uh, he comes out, he handed him a ginger ale, eh? <laughs> and he said, there you go. This is 15 Highway, or what they call, I think it's called Main Street down in the village. This was all commons, but now it's part of RMC. Uh, the famous dollar bills. And of course, the most famous person of all, Dollar Bill. You heard of him? No. He was a bootlegger. Down in, used to live down in the bay. I remember one time I found a war bond certificate on the hill one day and it was his name on it and I took it down and it was his, he lost it and I come out with a basket of candy and stuff like that just to, but uh, we got talking about him this morning in fact and uh, he was knowing that if a family didn't have anything, he'd go and leave food on the doorstep for them or something or other. He was kind of a great old person. Here's one. Pupils in front of Berryfield School. Oh, this is a real good one. You can see this one. I'd been one room schools, two of them here in Wolf Island, but then when we came to the to Berryfield Village, we had a very large one room school with a, an oversized cloakroom, but that served for three teachers. Today, it would never be allowed by any regulations, particularly safety, fire, etc. But I had the morning session in order to accommodate all the children. I taught the grades six, seven, and eight from 8.30 in the morning till 12.30. And then in the afternoon, Helen Schlichter taught grades four, five, three, four, five. And that was from 12.30 till 4.30. And Rita Kelly taught the grades one, two, and three. And they were all crammed into the cloakroom. Desks were tight together. You had to walk across the seats in order to get into your seat. My first teacher was Mrs. Bechtel. I remember her. She rode her bicycle every day from Kingston. Uh, she was a tall, well of course she was tall me because I was short, but uh, I think she was a tall woman and I remember her bicycle. Why would I remember her bicycle? We had a teacher there, Mrs. Baldewait. We, her and I didn't get along. Anyway, she She'd get mad and she'd get the teacher in the little room. This, I think Bechtel, her name was Mrs. Bechtel. 
man, she could lay the strap on you and she'd get her to strap the kids. So Elf and us went over one day, stuck the strap and cut it all up in little pieces, put it under a flagstone over behind the Berryfield house. And of course, Audrey seen us doing it and she went, let the cat out of the bag on us. So we all got a trimming again for that and they bought a new strap and made it even worse. So Elf got mad over that. He brought a set of side cutters in. This Mrs. Beckel used to ride a three-speed bicycle and she'd walk up the front of the school to the stop of the sidewalk around the guard rails and she'd take a run and down the road, jump on that bike and jump on the bike. And she wouldn't pedal again until she got to the causeway. Well, she made the corner down here at the bottom and it collapsed. And Elf went in and cut every other spoke on that bicycle of hers. And when she made the corner at the bottom. And she skidded from about that red truck going there all the way to that booth. She never come back to school. <laughs> she like never come back to school that year, I don't think. She could have killed her, you know, it was terrible. But Elf got every other spoke in the damn bicycle. Needless to say, we didn't get a strap for that one. It's a picture that was painted in 1896, at least that's what it's dated. And to my understanding, the best of my knowledge, it's a picture of Berryfield Village. Right here was the two-room schoolhouse. And on the back of that schoolhouse was a privy. Well, a toilet, if you would. And when I first saw this picture at my grandmother's, I thought, that's the schoolhouse. And that would be 15 Highway. And it does curve and goes up over the hill and then joins down here would be number two highway, and that goes straight back and joins number two highway. And I've been told that at that time, the number two highway, the cut, as we called it, the rock cut, wasn't there. It was a built a project that was uh, built during the depression to put people to work. And as I said, we used to go over and scale those walls. But this was the old road. And then 15 highway went on down through here. Highway 15 ran right through the village. And I can remember coming to Kingston first as an education student. I think the year was 1971 or two, 70, 71 maybe. And just being scared to death to drive through Berryfield because there was trucks behind you and trucks coming the other way and there was hardly room to squeeze through. And I could see, even then I had an interest in architecture and old buildings. I could see this was a fabulous place, but I couldn't take my eyes off the road because it was that precarious. That uh, changed when the highway was routed around Berryfield, and I think it was a lot of uh, local uh, effort that made that happen in addition to a will on the part of the Ministry of Transport. And that made Berryfield oh, suddenly, almost overnight, a lot more livable. We talked to the military about establishing a road to the east of Berryfield village over uh, army property which would meet up with uh, highway number two above the rock cut, to the east side of the rock cut. So that was established at that time and that in a way became the saving grace for Berryfield because we then had Berryfield which was a uh, somewhat derelict community uh, with lots of interesting buildings and lots of uh, small almost cottage-like houses wooden houses, not in the best of shape. And I then felt very strongly that in order to preserve that, we had to make sure that the uh, area should be put on the conservation list. If we wouldn't have done that, uh, developers would have bought up the cheap houses, and they were cheap at that time, 14000 16000 dollars they would have bought them up and they undoubtedly would have gone to council to tell everybody that we needed to have row housing or that we needed to have apartment complexes, etc. Yeah, the, uh, the, the water was all polluted, so there were, yeah. there, all the wells uh -huh. were polluted, so they froze uh -huh. all development in the village at that time because of that. Then people would have to go to the fire hydrants to get there your water. Some had holding tanks. The berry, the one over there had a big tank, caught rainwater, I guess. Yeah, that's and a cistern. Only Cist cistern. Yeah, lots of them cistern. had cisterns, yes. Cisterns. And mm. we had our own well, which was already, if we had the, chl the chlorinator was working. You know, they did have a lot of trouble with the well, and uh, gradually the, the military came, and they had a, a fire hydrant right there, eh? Mm. So they put a, a tap on the fire hydrant for us. 
But the problem with that was that if you didn't leave it dripping, yeah. it would freeze up and bust. <laughs> Some days you go up to water and it would be broken. The water would be running all over the road. We have redoubt number two over here, just to the northeast or in the northeast corner of, uh, of Barry Field. Uh, I've penciled in here, this is not an original part of the drawing, I've penciled in the location, general location of where St. Mark's Church is, that's that little gray rectangle there. And it gives an idea of how close the church was constructed to where the British wanted to construct the redoubt and the ditch that surrounded it. For uh, various political and monetary reasons, they never did acquire this property, and so uh, redoubt number two was never constructed. The ditch surrounding the redoubt at Fort Henry gives, uh, gives you a good sense of the scale of the fortifications that would have been constructed around Kingston, uh, all the five redoubts, including redoubt number two. Uh, the ditch would have been, for that redoubt, similar to the one we're in right now, about 40 feet wide. The walls of the, the redoubt itself would have been about 30 feet high, much like you see here. Thickness is about the same, four to 10 feet thick, depending on the location and the counterscarp wall would have been in masonry as well. So what we see here in this ditch gives us a very good idea of what any of the redoubts surrounding Kingston would have looked like uh, if you were standing in their ditches had they been constructed. The Canadian Army was small until the beginning of the First World War when it of course increased in size considerably. And by early 1915, there were uh, 30,000 in the Army and they needed to be better organized and they had been so they were put firstly into battalions um, then into brigades and finally the four brigades into what became known as the first Canadian division. Uh, later on it was joined by other Canadian divisions as the army increased in size and they needed to distinguish the members of the first division from the others and so that is where they wore the red rectangular patch on the right shoulder of their uniforms as it notes on the, uh, the monument here. The first division served all the way through the first world war in all of the major battles. Um, it disbanded in 1919, but when Canada entered the Second World War, again it, uh, it was resurrected. The 1st Division went to England uh, and later would fight in Sicily and Italy and would finish the war in the Netherlands and again be disbanded. Um, and it wasn't until 1988 that it was yet again brought back into being. Uh, and it was at this point that this monument was put up in memory of those who had served and of those who would serve and were serving at the time in the 1st Division. Very, very special part of the Canadian Army remembered here in Barrafield. Oh, this is in beautiful condition. The church has had a long association with the Royal Military College. Now the college was formed in 1876, uh, some time after St. Mark's, and for many years the uh, students used to march here, the cadets, um, and come to a service at least once a year. But uh, something had happened, which is a rather interesting story. The church had a bell in its uh, tower, but it wasn't a very good bell. And the parishioners knew that there was a very good bell over on the site of the old uh, naval dockyard. Now that bell had been there probably for 50 years because the Navy used the bell to tell the time. Well, this is the well-known Bartlett print of Kingston from the heights of Fort Henry Hill. Somewhat exaggerated, but nevertheless interesting in that it shows a considerable amount of detail. The naval dockyard on Point Frederick uh, in the 1830s, the, the naval buildings and the actual dockyard enclosed by the dockyard fence. The entrance to the dockyard would be here and at the entrance was the pole with the dockyard bell, uh, which is illustrated here, uh, would have been hanging there throughout the existence of the dockyard. And when the Navy uh, ceased to run the dockyard, they just left the bell there. So the parishioners knew about this and they went to uh, the local member of parliament and said, do you think we could have the bell? Well, he happened to be not only the member of parliament, but he was also a parishioner of the church. And he said, oh yeah, you can have the bell. So they took the bell and had it mounted. It was a very nice bell. 
And so that was in the church from about 1871. Well, comes along, RMC is founded in 1876, and 100 years later, in 1976, they're celebrating their centennial, and somebody said, we, we used to have a bell. <laughs> well, after a bit of historical research, they suddenly found out the bell was in, a, in St. Mark's Church. And after a bit of negotiation, it was agreed that the bell would be given back uh, to uh, the RMC, the original bell, and as a part of a sort of a, a gift exchange, they presented us with a, uh, one of their colors, which is mounted on the wall over here. So our St. Mark's has a uh, retired color of the Royal Military College of Science. Tell me what your reaction was when you uh, first saw this uh, photograph. Well, I thought he was kidding. I didn't believe for a moment that this was the house that I just bought. And uh, it wasn't until I called him that he uh, convinced me that this was indeed the, the house that, we, that I'd bought and that it was going to look a lot better. He guaranteed it would look a lot better when he fixed it up. But I was quite surprised. I was a bit annoyed as well because I thought he was, uh, first of all, I questioned whether he really knew what he was doing. And secondly, I, uh, you know, I, just, I didn't see it. He had the vision that what this could be. I certainly didn't. I just looked at it initially thinking I've just thrown away, you know, X amount of dollars on something that I'll never use or never see a, a return on. I think probably if you go out in the country and other little villages, you know, Lyndhurst or someplace, it'll be the same. It'd be the same, you know, and I think they're probably still close knit like the village was, you know, and because they haven't expanded like the village has. So I just can't believe the change over there. God, you go through there now, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I haven't been back to Berryfield in years. Years and years. I would rather remember it the way it was than what it is. It, it was turning, I don't use the word yuppieville, but there were people that were interested in just preserving the heritage. For us, it was old. <laughs> and it wasn't the heritage, it was just old. You gotta make it new. And that's our mentality. But now, you can look around, we've got all the old stuff. Yeah. Well, one of these ladies actually was my grandmother, Ricky, before she was married. She was a leader. Kind of think it was this lady, but I'm not, I, not 100%. I kind of think it is from his, that was the only person that was taking pictures way back when, as far as I know. I don't think there was anybody else, but it was a, basically a hobby he had. I think a lot of people are drawn to Barryfield because it's so beautiful. One of the things about Barryfield is it's, a, it's an aggregation of interesting historic architecture in a distinctive cultural heritage landscape. It's, it's quasi-rural, um, so no one house is all that amazing. Um, none of the houses are really very grand. But the collection of houses in this setting bordered by the Cataraqui River and what was agricultural land outside uh, makes it quite special. It didn't look at all like uh, many of the other parts of Kingston and um, in some respects it seemed like an old English village, a little bit like Salem in Boston, a whole mixture of heritage components and uh, uh, I drove all the streets in about seven minutes flat and there was one house for sale, and this is the house we're in now. We looked at the house, took the number of the real estate agent, phoned her, and stayed until we bought the house. And then we continued to Quebec for Christmas, so uh, fairly uh, quick decision. But as it turned out, uh, quite a wonderful decision, because we really didn't understand we were living in a heritage village, or we would be living in a heritage village. And it was interesting to find out the extent of that and the depth of what that really meant. There are bureaucratic hoops that you have to jump through uh, living in a designated heritage village or a heritage building. Uh, and those hoops are, they can also be very expensive. Sharpie. So for example, if you wanted to change your windows, uh, put, put new windows in, um, you would have to go to the heritage committee and present your proposal and they would talk with you about it and they might require that you 
uh, put in a certain type of windows that, you know, have certain features that are consistent with the, um, with the era of the village or the building. And uh, you will have to go out and perhaps get those windows made specially, uh, you know, if that's what's required. The only thing I would change if I could, I wish they made a storm window that looked like these old ones because the, uh, or a regular window, I guess, because, you know, I remember growing up as a, as a young boy, the, the worst job in the fall and the spring was taking down or putting up the storm windows. And now I have to do it all over for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, lots of people, I suppose, um, um, I would argue uninformed people, wonder why uh, we might pay so much attention to things like the details associated with windows or other aspects of historic buildings. And I think um, everyone agrees that it's a tragedy when a historic building burns or gets demolished, for instance. But I, I've always argued that we lose just as many by attrition. That is to say, the roof gets changed, the windows get changed, the porch comes off, the door gets changed, the siding gets changed. And ultimately, you wonder whether or not you really even have a historic building left. These houses look totally different. My Uncle Ernie's house, again, it used to have a big porch on it. And it looks so much smaller now. <laughs> Wilson's lived there. Yeah, this is amazing. It looks so much different. It had a big veranda that went across the front, came out almost to here. And he had the big stuffed billy goat on the veranda. He was a barber and Ernie played the saxophone on Christmas and we would go around the village and carol. Sears lived here. I'm not too sure the house is not wider. I was living, however, in Pittsburgh Township and I approached the council of Pittsburgh Township to make sure that we also had a heritage preservation uh, committee here in the township and that was established uh, and I was one of the early members of, of that committee but there were other people very important in that committee here in Pittsburgh Township itself but ultimately that led to uh, the preservation of Berryfield as a, a conservation uh, heritage district which was the first one in the province of Ontario well, I think um, when we look around us and we see sort of real historic buildings, um, in terms of their value to the uh, community, um, I think these things are touchstones for people to the past um, in such a way that, um, you know, Disneyland would never be. But the whole notion that um, um, we can walk the streets of Kingston or maybe the streets of Berryfield and see uh, historic properties that have been here for a couple hundred years and the people that have walked the same streets and walked in and out of those doors have been witnesses to the War of 1812 or the 1837 Rebellion or their son marched off to the Boer War or the Great War or the Second War. I mean. All of these things, I think, contribute to a cultural landscape that uh, is very important. And it's one of those things, unfortunately, you don't know what you had till it's gone oftentimes. I think people take it for granted. I spent lots of time, as everybody in Berryfield does, having walks and looking at the old houses. And I don't think you can live here and not now and then try and imagine what it was like 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, because the, the buildings just cry out almost with their history as you walk through the streets. Apparently when um, the house was renovated, they found the foundations to the old log cabin there. So as that was his secretary, I think he probably did go there. That's what I was thinking anyway, when I was told that that's where his secretary lived. So I was imagining that he probably did walk along there because he was quite fond of port. So if he had a port companion, 
I'm sure he would have gone there. <laughs> And I found out how this place ended up in our family. Yeah, the veranda was a lot different. It was more enclosed. But, yeah, there is, it's, uh, I guess it's because the streets are that much wider. Uh, the fence used to be out farther. And I think there's more front yard than there used to be this way. We used to park the car on the other side. That was my Uncle Dick's house. That was the one we renovated, my wife and I. And that was my mother's as well. We owned that. I couldn't see over the counter from inside, and I couldn't wait to look over the counter. I remember when I could first look up, and I don't know whether they put something on the floor, but anyway, I could look over the counter, then the store counter. We had the first. We had a telephone, and it wasn't a pay phone, it was just a bell telephone. Everybody come here to use the phone. I don't know if there was any, many other phones in the village. And during the war, you had to have a license for a radio. And we had a radio in there, and of course, not too many people had them. And Mr. Hewitt used to come up there. We'd be listening to the Lone Ranger or the squeaking door or something like that. And of course, he'd come up and turn the damn thing to the CBC to war news. And, we weren't too happy with that, Mary and I. Well, I think we are all lucky who live in Kingston to live in a, a city this old and with this kind of heritage and character. Um, it's a curious twist of history, I guess, that um, history passed Kingston by and that the capital was in, ended up being in Ottawa and the provincial capitals in Toronto. And in many ways, Kingston was unimportant. And thank goodness, because that means we have quite a collection of interesting heritage buildings in the downtown and in the rural areas around it, as well as in Barryfield. So I really think that Barryfield is Kingston's heritage village. It's a place that all of Kingstonians should enjoy, come, and indeed they do. They come here for Sunday drives and walks, for runs, for cycling. Um, and I think it's appropriate for everyone to feel a sense of stewardship and pride in this village um, as a part of the, the, the heritage fabric of the city as a whole. Part of the notion of a village is that, um, I mean, a, vi a village isn't really a village um, unless there is the absence of, um, of, of uh, residential areas around it. So it. Almost like an island, it, it depends on the sea in order to be an island. Otherwise it's, so a village, in order to be a village, needs the absence of the village around it in, in order to sort of preserve that notion. Yeah, the deer like to, um, the deer like to sort of sleep in this area. I, I can think of parts of, uh, of uh, big cities, in Toronto for example, where I used to live, there, there's an area called a village, and yet it's right in the heart of a big city, so it's hard to think of that as a village when it's, you know, there's no real boundary, there's no end to it. So having the, oh, the, yes. the <laughs> absence of, yep. of uh, building uh, around, um, helps define bushes in over there what, and what the village is. This rose bush is just laden with rose hips. Look at how red and bright and beautiful they are. Beautiful in the fall. It was beautiful in the spring when you came down the path and all of a sudden there's a rose bush covered with blossom. Single blossoms, I don't know what kind they were. There was also, also um, honeysuckle mi mixed in with it. And you can see in there, there are more rose bushes. Just beautiful. That's why I like working here. Everything looks so mixed up all together, not cultivated just as it happened. Now, uh, I think if I had a, 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 an overriding comment to make, it would be one that reflects the opinion of a current LACAC resident. My good friend Craig Sims, who wishes to remain nameless, so that'll be up to you whether you edit this out or not who said that the right things will never happen in a heritage conservation district as long as the authority to make decisions on the built environment in a heritage conservation district rests with local politicians. And that these kinds of decisions and guidelines should be formulated and 
made and enforced at the provincial level. That way it takes some of the neighbor versus neighbor out of the equation, takes some of human nature out of the equation. It's a lot easier to get sore at Queen's Park, they're way down there in Toronto, but still go along with them because you don't really have any choice. Bucknells, do you remember the Bucknells lived in there and where Peter is? That's the barn for the Bucknell. They had the Jersey cow. Mother, mother's mother would send us up for milk when, when during the war. I was just a kid, and you, you, cream was hard to get, butter. So she'd get from Jersey cow. Do you not remember coming up there? I do. But he had, they had a Jersey cow in there. And when they left Barryfield, they turned around. I'm glad I came back. It was worth it. I don't think I have to remember it as it was. It's nice to see it as it is now. The yards even look smaller. <laughs> like I, I think at the time too, Barryfield wasn't just a place to live at one time. Everybody thought it was the slum of the world, but now everybody wants to live there. <laughs> we always said it was the Capitol Hill because it was the best place to live. Summertime was always cool up there. It was hot in Kingston, but it was always cool up there. No, it was a great place to be raised and, and live. A lot of good people come out of that village. It's a picture taken from our boathouse that was on the shore below the Knapp property. But, uh, yeah, it was good times.